It is my incredibly great honor to introduce Jonathan Sarna, who is a personal hero of mine, so it's a big deal to me. Uh, Dr. Sarna was born in Philadelphia, but raised in New York and Boston. He attended Brandeis, Hebrew College in Boston, the Merkaz Harav Cook in Jerusalem, and received his doctorate from Yale University. He then taught at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion on the Cincinnati campus before returning to Brandeis, where he is now the Joseph H. and Bell R. Braun Professor of American Jewish History and Chair of the Hornstein Jewish Professional Leadership Program. He is also the, ch the Chair of the Academic Advisory and Editorial Board of the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati. Dr. Sarna has written, edited, or co-edited more than 30 books, including his most recent, When General Grant Expelled the Jews, and he's best known for his acclaimed book, American Judaism, A History, which won the Jewish Book Council's Jewish Book of the Year Award in 2004. Also in 2004, the foreword named Dr. Sarna one of America's 50 most influential American Jews. He is recognized as a leading commentator on American Jewish history and religion and life. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jonathan Sarna. Well, thank you and good afternoon. It's uh, really an honor to be here as I've been telling people this is really a once-in-a-century opportunity. I, uh, I wasn't going to miss it. Uh, I have to admit, though, that standing here, I'm, I'm reminded of the story of a Jewish woman named Chaya who miraculously survived the great Johnstown flood of 1889. Chaya lived a long life. Eventually, her time Came and she ascended to heaven, whereupon she was immediately admitted. The angel Gabriel warmly welcomed her and informed her that it was the custom in heaven that newcomers deliver lectures about their experiences back on earth. Oh, very well, said Chaya enthusiastically. I will give a talk on my experiences during the great Johnstown flood of 1889. Excellent, the angel replied. He wrote it down. But do please remember, as you are preparing your lecture, that Noah will be sitting in the audience. <laughs> As I was preparing my remarks, I too <laughs> constantly remembered that others far more learned than I am concerning the women of Reform Judaism and its history are sitting in this audience, so it's a very uh, daunting assignment. Now, uh, the National Federation of Temple Sisterhoods, which, as we have already learned, was the original name of the women of Reform Judaism was one of 65 national Jewish organizations listed in the American Jewish Yearbook of 1913 and 14. Only four of those organizations were headed by women. The NFTS, the National Council of Jewish Women, which you heard a bit about from Professor Nadell, the Independent Order of True Sisters, and a small sorority named Sigma Theta Pi. Uh, it was no small matter to found a national organization by and for women in 1913. Local women's organizations had long existed but a national organization with a national meeting demanded travel and autonomy, which, as somebody suggested earlier in 1913, still sometimes 
raised eyebrows. The establishment of NFTS with women leaders and biennial meetings bespoke a growing sense of women's independence within Reform Jewish life. For a century, the women of Reform Judaism both reflected that independence and worked hard to nurture it. And many of the daughters of WRJ leaders who are here with us today could probably echo uh, the six words that Abby Pogrebin recently used in describing her mother. Her mother is Letty uh, Cotton Pogrebin. Abby wrote this to about her mother in six words on Mother's Day. Mom was leaning in before Sandberg. <laughs> well, the women of Reform Judaism were leaning in before Sandberg, too. Now, the fact that we know so much about the WRJ and its history is really a great tribute to the historical consciousness of WRJ's leadership. From the beginning, they wrote everything down and they saved it. And in time, they presented it as they should have to the American Jewish archives. Now I have to tell you, I have spent lots of hours and days in archives in my time, and I have never seen an institutional archive that is as comprehensive and complete as yours. Uh, it is truly remarkable. And let me give you, well, you should applaud yourself. Absolutely. Let me give you an example of what I mean and why it is so significant. I once wrote an article about a certain synagogue that was engaged in a sensitive discussion concerning whether one of its members was marrying according to Jewish law and whether its rabbi should be permitted to perform that marriage. The synagogue's minutes, which I read, briefly laid out the problem, and then, to my great disappointment, they reported, and I quote, quote, a great while was spent in debating the issue. <laughs> That's all. Everything that I really wanted to know about that crucial debate was nowhere to be found. Contrast your minutes. In 1929, the NFTS discussed an ever timely issue in Jewish life, quote, ways and means of increasing temple attendance. A complete transcript of that discussion survives, it is wonderfully illuminating. One synagogue leader, a sisterhood leader, boasted that in her congregation, quote, children are encouraged to bring their parents and relatives to the temple, <laughs> a silver star being given them for each Friday night they come, for 10 silver stars, a gold one is given. Some of you remember that. Some women present thought that this was a splendid plan for all, tem uh, for all temples, but then an articulate dissident protested against it. Temple attendance, she observed, is the national Jewish malady. Poking fun at the silver and gold stars, she exclaimed that so far, everything has been offered as an inducement except those wonderful California prunes. <laughs> okay. 
just see what somebody's going to suggest uh, the next. Uh, <laughs> Instead of more inducements, she suggested that the time had come to get at the real fundamental causes of this trouble. And that comment opened up the floodgates, and there are five double-spaced pages of discussion that follow, including uh, criticisms, I hadn't realized Rabbi Jacobs would be here, criticisms of boring services. <laughs> overly long sermons, <laughs> concerns about Jewish illiteracy, and most revealing of all, the complaint that the rabbi blamed sisterhood for the poor attendance at services, <laughs> when the real problem lay with, and I quote, the man in the pulpit. <laughs> Now, here, of course, uh, we see gender politics at play, but more significantly, this remarkable transcript, one of many, enables us to re-experience the freewheeling give and take and drama of the NFTS board and biennial meetings. They served as forums where women truly spoke their minds concerning major Jewish issues of the day. For a historian, the women's frank discussion of synagogue attendance actually sheds light on American Jewish religious life as a whole in 1929 when that discussion took place. That is an era that historians now talk about as the great religious depression. And then as now, the problem of poor attendance at services led to something of a blame game. That's a technical term that historians <laughs> use. Uh, but reading between the lines, one can discern the seeds of change being planted and the post-World War II revival of American religion, including American Judaism, including uh, newly built suburban temples and synagogues, really responded to some of the kinds of complaints aired by these perceptive women. And as we know, in the 1950s, synagogue and temple attendance rebounded. Now, of course, we're back where we were in 1929 with the same kind of discussions. But my point here is that past history, the uncensored, freewheeling debates that your predecessors so carefully preserved permit us to trace change over time and to illuminate through past experience challenges that we continue to face today. Now, another timely lesson from the past that we learn from your remarkable archive concerns the critical but often unpredictable character of creative innovation. In the startup culture of the 21st century, it is widely appreciated that 90% of new ideas fail, while 10% take off, transforming lives and institutions in ways sometimes that nobody could possibly have predicted in advance. Think Google and Facebook and Twitter and how they have transformed our world beyond the wildest imaginations even of their founders. Now, anyone who studies the WRJ archive can discern similar lessons concerning innovation. Indeed, the WRJ has long served as an incubator 
for innovative and productive ideas that have made history and changed the course of American Jewish life. So in my own research for uh, the volume that will appear in December, splendid, spectacular volume, I really, I, I, the, the whole volume is, 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 is full of wonderful material. And my, my, uh, my chapter focused on the innovations brought about by a little known but highly creative early leader of NFTS named Barbara Solomon Goodman of Louisville, Kentucky, born in 1868. She is usually identified in the minutes uh, following what you've already heard was the practice of the time as Mrs. Leon Goodman. Widowed at 40, she was a founder and first president of Adath Israel's Temple Sisterhood in Louisville, and then for 17 years, the effervescent chair of one of NFTS's most important and energetic standing committees, its National Committee on Religion. For an innovative person like Barbara Goodman, the committee's broad mission statement, quote, devising various ways whereby the religious spirit may be deepened, that mission statement was absolutely fabulous. It stimulated all of her creative juices. Well, her first idea back in 1913, a hundred years ago, was for NFTS to create a Jewish art calendar. Some of you heard a little bit about that from Dr. Zolman, as an artistic reminder of things Jewish. That Rosh Hashanah, the first calendar appeared. Six sheets of heavy paper, each bearing a copy of some famous picture illustrating the different Jewish holidays. It bombed, was not a success at all. Uh, and it wasn't successful in its second year or in its third year. It made no money. But in the fourth year, the committee introduced a new design with higher quality art and improved aesthetics. Think Steve Jobs, aesthetics matter. Look at this magnificent synagogue, you'll see aesthetics matter. Um, suddenly, the Jewish art calendar took off and in short order, as some of us heard, it became something of an NFTS trademark, a winning combination of aesthetics, education, and Jewish symbolism that came to adorn thousands of reformed Jewish homes while augmenting uh, sisterhood treasuries. Nobody could have predicted the calendar's vast impact in advance. It informed Jewish women of the time and dates of Jewish holidays, thereby helping them to live according to the rhythms of Jewish time. Hung on the wall, some of them once hung on the wall, it served as a kind of surrogate mezuzah, proclaiming a home to be tastefully, yet demonstrably Jewish. It promoted the nascent field of Jewish art, providing uh, exposure to a range of emerging artists, women and men alike. And of course, it turned out to be a great business venture as well, so good that it eventually spawned many imitators. The Jewish arts calendar was what we might today call a disruptive innovation. It changed the course of American Jewish life. And you can see more uh, in, in Joellen's uh, chapter. Now, Barbara Goodman and her committee uh, soon pressed forward with other innovations. In 1927, she may well have invented the first Hanukkah cards. They were an instant success, 
contributed to the nationwide revival of Hanukkah, which, as everybody here knows, is today one of our most widely celebrated Jewish holidays, but that was not true a century ago. In 1929, Barbara Goodman pioneered what she called a kiddish card, an attractive table card to promote the sanctification of Shabbat in the Jewish home. And most important of all, I think, she established and encouraged the sisterhood service, a Shabbat service in the fall devoted to sisterhood and led by sisterhood women. Now, this innovation soon took on a life of its own with historically revolutionary implications that continue to resonate today. And let me give you a bit of that history just to illustrate how innovation happens. The Sisterhood Service actually began in 1916 as a modest attempt to promote synagogue attendance by women and also to bring publicity to the work of the Sisterhood and to create an opportunity for talented women to speak publicly before a mixed congregation. Within just two years, women across the country were conducting the entire service on Sisterhood Sabbath and delivering what were described as inspiring messages. By 1926, the synagogue sisterhood service had become a fixture in most reform congregations. It not only marked the important role that women played in Judaism, it also, at least in some of those congregations, provided annual testimony to women's religious competence, displaying how well they could on their own conduct services and deliver sermons. More than anyone could initially have anticipated, the sisterhood service assumed a quietly subversive role, for it actually called into question traditional gender assumptions concerning the role of women in synagogue life. And by the time Barbara Goodman retired, she herself understood that a revolution was brewing. One of the most amazing quotes that I found in the WRJ archive was from her final report before she retired on the sisterhood service. The sisterhood service in November, she wrote in 19. 1930 is often a revelation of what the women may do if they ever enter the rabbinate. Wow. Now, to be sure, not all of Barbara Goodman's innovations turned out quite so well. Her campaign to promote the saying of grace before and after meals went nowhere. Her adult education efforts failed. A project designed to produce a book of meditations and prayers for women, absolute fiasco. In retrospect, however, those and other failures hardly mattered. Her successes like the Jewish Arts Calendar and the Sisterhood Service are what truly mattered, for in the end, they made history. They helped to revolutionize American Jewish life. And there is a very important historical lesson here, and later uh, Jane Evans, during the course of her very long career as your leader, she understood that lesson very well. By creating a culture of innovation, welcoming and 
incubating creative projects of every sort, sisterhood makes it possible for great ideas to succeed and flourish. Nobody can predict in advance which ideas will succeed and flourish. Barbara Goodman made many mistakes, Jane Evans made mistakes, even Steve Jobs made many mistakes. They once fired him, as you remember. So our job is to encourage a wide range of creative thinkers and doers. Remember, it only takes a few great innovative successes to more than justify a slew of forgettable failures. Now, looking back over a century of WRJ history, I was struck beyond the subject of innovation by how many of WRJ's most successful and innovative projects followed from a broad and capacious vision of Jewish life. Repeatedly, sisterhoods recognized unmet needs in the Jewish community and took it upon themselves to address those needs often in an altruistic way. So, for example, the decision to create what became the sisterhood dorm at the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati stemmed from a concern that HUC boys, and yes, they were all boys in those benighted days, many of them actually were high school age teenagers, and they had to shift for themselves as students uh, boarding in rooming houses or spare bedrooms where they were exposed, as the minutes delicately put it, to dangers from within and without. Uh, initially, some wondered whether the perils facing teenage rabbinical students really formed part of sisterhood's mandate. Why not leave that problem to the HUC Board of Governors, or to the CCR rabbis, or to the local Jews of Cincinnati? The answer, supplied by NFTS President Patty Weisenfeld in 1921, could scarcely have been more definitive. The welfare of the Hebrew Union College, she declared, is part of our duty. And she articulated an expansive vision for the organization. And as a result of that, in a remarkably short time, the necessary funds were raised and the dormitory was built. David Ellenson in the volume has a wonderful chapter with all of the details. From then onward, Sisterhood refused to confine themselves to a narrow sphere limited only to reform Jewish women. They defined their mission broadly. So another example of what I mean by a capacious vision. In the 1920s, spurred by Jean May, who was actually the daughter of Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise, the National Federation of Temple Sisterhoods became involved in youth work, creating a national federation of young folks' temple leagues, a forerunner of NIFTI. Some once again question whether youth work should be part of Sisterhood's mission. Why not leave that to schools and bureaus of Jewish education and keep Sisterhood focused squarely on women? But Jean May, like Hattie Weisenfeld before her, refused to constrain sisterhood in that way. Nothing less than the future of American Judaism was at stake in her view, and she persuaded the sisterhoods 
to establish a standing committee on young folks' temple leagues that played an enormous role in incubating and shaping the youth arm of the reform movement. And today, when youth engagement is so vital a part of the URJ agenda, it is worth recalling the critical role that you play in the genesis of that effort. Your predecessors saw an unmet need in Jewish life and took it upon themselves to address that need. And Professor Jonathan Krasner's forthcoming chapter, from which I have borrowed all of this information, <laughs> tells this important story uh, for the very first time. A third example along these same lines concerns Sisterhood's work with the blind. In 1931, at the depth of the worst depression in American history, the National Federation of Temple Sisterhoods astonishingly agreed to support a Braille magazine of Jewish content. In this case, the appeal to sisterhood actually came from a man, Rabbi Michael Aronson, a CCAR rabbi who had been tragically blinded in World War I. In response to the unmet need that Rabbi Aronson spelled out, sisterhoods founded and incubated the Jewish Braille Institute. And in the years that followed, an army of dedicated sisterhood women transcribed thousands of books into Braille and thereby made it possible for blind Jewish women and men to gain an education, to learn and practice Judaism. Uh, by the way, Judaism of all sorts. They, they did reform prayer books, conservative prayer books, orthodox prayer books, all the movements, and they thereby enabled the blind to live richer and more independent lives. Jane Evans personally devoted an astonishing 60 years of service to JBI, 1933 to 1993, and always insisted that its work was an extension of what sisterhood was all about. By strengthening Jewish life generally, she understood that women were helping to fulfill the broadest dimensions of the WRJ mission. And see Dr. Dana Herman's forthcoming chapter for further details. So to conclude, looking back over a century of service, we can see that sisterhoods empowered Jewish women and gave them a greater voice in Jewish life. They encouraged and incubated innovations. They articulated for women a broad and capacious mission that focused upon unmet needs. American Jews, whether they know it or not, have all been strengthened by sisterhood's heroic and historic efforts. But it would be a mistake, I think, for the women of Reform Judaism to rest on those laurels. Women's organizations, even the WRJ, must today creatively reinvent themselves in the face of the unprecedented changes that have transformed women's lives over the past half century. Fortunately, you have fabulous records, and you'll soon have a magnificent work of history based on those records to illuminate your road from 1913 to 2013. 
looking forward, let this remarkable past both inspire and guide you as you embark upon your second century and beyond. Thank you very much.